All right, welcome back. This is uh, part two, continuation of chapter five, and the topic's on energy. And as promised, I hope after this uh, session that we have together, you'll never look at a leaf the same way again. And so what you're actually looking at, of course, is it, using a drawing, is sort of everyone's seen a leaf. Uh, we have layers and we have certain machinery on the inside and the machinery we're going to talk about a chloroplast and there's there are various uh, regions inside the leaf but a lot of things go on inside of uh, this leaf that really doesn't have anything to do in fact doesn't want the color green by the way we'll talk about that so sunlight energy so there's some things that we got to look at uh, overall in this process of photosynthesis to really give you the insight and uh, the the wonder of what's going on so first of all keep in mind the visible spectrum of light the visible light the Sun has all of those frequencies and when I say frequency it's a uh, light that's emanating it's it's going up and down up and down and it somewhere along the line okay at each of these frequencies generates it such that we see it as color we perceive it as color and so we see the rainbow the typical rainbow and then of course there's a whole series of light uh, well is uh, frequencies that we we can't detect with our eyes so the human eye can see uh, in these regions of the visible light because uh, we see them as emanating that frequency in color and we of course know the Roy Gibb uh, V is the the red and orange and yellow and so forth and uh, pigments uh, are molecules that absorb light now we have pigments in our eyes that absorb light and when that frequency resonates and we're going to talk about how important the word resonate is but when the frequency match with a particular pigment, there's this phenomenon of resonance and it starts to shake when it's resonant. In other words, the, the match is the frequency of the way something likes to sort of be shaken. And so when we find that resonance frequency, uh, the pigment will start to shake. And when we see that in our eye, it fires off a neuron and your brain says, oh, I see red or whatever uh, the color is. So, the overall process of photosynthesis, you know, looking at it from the big picture, and this has stunned a lot of students. Uh, it's one of the questions that they ask on standard uh, exams and the like. And so where does the plant matter come from? It's just kind of growing in, it just come out of the pot and the, the soil and all that. Well, actually in the process of growing and photosynthesis it captures out of the air co2 the very amount that we breathe out and the co2 and when the plant goes through the process of photosynthesis it leaves out or produces oxygen which is amazing because gee that's what we use to breathe in so the plants are our best friend of course it keeps us with the environment so photosynthesis is really really important and it provides the air that we breathe but it also the carbon dioxide provides that we breathe out uh, with the carbon material to help uh, build the things the plant needs to, uh, to grow itself and there's microorganisms and various other uh, water uh, bearing uh, organisms that can actually uh, grow uh, utilizing photosynthesis and uh, driving uh, those energy needs from uh, the Sun and I just didn't want you to think it's just plants bacteria and, and dinoflagellates and kelp and various things like that will do that but all of these utilize one central thing what happens in plants is probably the best and cleanest form of energy that uh, and it's one of my favorites is cracking water yes it takes water using photon energy that's about 1.23 electrovolts 
it shakes water so violently that it splits it into hydrogen and oxygen. It's cracking water, essentially. And when it does that, the hydrogen molecule right here becomes the important driver. This is what uh, drives all of the energy formation in terms of ATP right there. And we're going to talk about that. I'm going to go ahead and tell you that what that hydrogen does, uh, that ion, will uh, charge batteries. And uh, I say that, let me show you how it does it. But first of all, this concept of resonant frequency. So if you look at a particular frequency, if I were to shine or create a let's say a frequency that uh, using a tuning fork and if I had that tuning fork just right the optimum resonant frequency I can shake the water molecule so violently that it would literally the hydrogens would fall off and it puts so much force intermolecular forces between the oxygen and the hydrogen it can't hold it together only at the resonant frequency it's putting so much energy in the system it shakes it so violently it falls apart and that's cracking water which is the same thing we do to make fuel cells uh, with hydrogen and oxygen uh, it, we drive uh, the fuel cell with hydrogen and we create electri electricity to drive the car using the fuel cell and it's it, it's really the analogy with the plants almost one for one now what you typically have been taught uh, is here's photosynthesis sunlight water and carbon dioxide outputs oxygen and sugar which is totally true but how it does that that's the key that's what's amazing so we have three inputs and two outputs okay we're going to talk about all of it but the sun energy is the key through photosynthesis plants use water energy of sunlight carbon dioxide gas from the atmosphere to produce sugars and other organic materials in the process photosynthesizing organisms produce oxygen which makes all of life uh, animal life possible of course it breathes oxygen so the plant part is green then you know it's photosynthetic leaves are green because of the cells near the surface are packed full of chloroplasts well it's not totally true but this is the story your book's telling uh, a lot of what you're seeing in color by the way it's reflected so it's actually not it, it's reflecting away that color out of the sun so green actually some forms of the green actually interfere with the process so we got to kind of filter it out and the way to do that is just to reflect it so light harvesting organelles which make it possible for the plant to use energy from sunlight to make sugars their food and other plant tissue much of uh, which animals use for food other plant parts such as stems may also use chloroplasts which in which case too they are capable of photosynthesis but most chloroplasts are located within the cells in a plant's leaf. Now the reason is that we have to have a, some sort of containment because the reactions that are occurring inside are uh, just sort of uh, amazing. It's just amazing what's going on. So just again looking at the leaf, that sectional one is a little bit better picture you can kind of see. Uh, the chloroplasts are impacted in these little sort of uh, cells that are inside. So we have a, kind of two rows of them on the top and then the lower and then we got some uh, air handlers to keep the, the plant um, from not overheating and that sort of thing. And if a plant is green then you know it's photosyn uh, photosynthetic. Uh, in other words, it photosynthesized, but really it's that green color that we so come to, to know about photosynthesis is actually a problem. And, um, well, it's part of the equation, let's put it that way. So let's look at it. Here's the containment areas. Now we call these stacks within the liquid part of the chloroplast. So this is a chloroplast. These are little containments. Think of it as like little nuclear power plants, each of them. And they're stacked and they're called thylakoid. And these are light harvesting organelles. This is where the, the sunlight cracks the water and to create the hydrogen to charge 
the uh, battery and you're going to see what I'm talking about. So chlorophyll is a molecule found in chloroplast that makes the capture of light possible. So it's just part of the equation. So follow along with me hopefully and uh, you'll see what I'm saying. So the sac, this is filled with a, a, a material, it's sort of the gooey center, but it, it's the stroma and inside these stacked thylakoids and their containment. So uh, we have uh, the formation of what makes the energy and then the stroma is where the synthesis part of photosynthesis occurs out here. And we're going to talk about that. It's really easy because it's the day reaction requiring the sunlight and then a the night reaction. But let's just talk about the day reaction. So the conversion of light to chemical energy is the photo part. And then we're going to talk about the nighttime production of sugars later. Uh, but I just want to kind of bring that up now. So we have photosynthesis occurs in the chloroplast and occurs in these green organelles packed in the cells plants. Hmm, I wonder why I keep mentioning it's green. So light energy comes in, which is a full spectrum of light. And it's, of course, kinetic energy. Uh, that's energy that's in photons, so it's moving, it's doing. And they don't really know what a photon is. Is it a wave? It's a particle? What is it? Um, and it's beyond my pay grade. I can't really tell you. I kind of fall in the wavelength uh, our argument. And wavelength, like sound, you know, everything has a particular frequency. Every color and, and uh, you, the shades of that color will have a slightly different uh, frequency. And uh, the reason why this is important is that frequency is is the magic key. There's a lot about this we don't understand. There's so much to this uh, that uh, it's made reference as in the Bible about you know the sound of the trumpet and destroying all sorts of things. The sound is is so so important, and uh, we're going to come into that. So resonance is just add energy at the right frequency such that uh, like in Harry Potter when um, supposedly she have that perfect tone to break the glass and she evidently doesn't have the perfect tone but if you have a glass and you're able to uh, generate 550 Hertz and that's a frequency so it's 550 is the energy of the wavelength that occurs it hurts is a frequency and so you can kind of represent the frequency with these up and down strokes here so this is 2.5 times 10 to the 15 Hertz and you can see that at that frequency the outer electron actually is vibrating so violently it goes into the next orbit where if you have different frequencies like 2.13 uh, to 10 to the 6 hertz, it really doesn't disrupt the uh, vibration, the, uh, the the pattern of that electron. So the frequencies, when it resonates, it makes a change and uh, so violently shakes that it changes the energy balance within uh, whatever is being uh, exposed to that uh, frequency. So just to, what do we know about the photons you know this uh, is it uh, a particle is it a wave they have zero mass they only exist as moving particles and that's Einstein's uh, there's a whole uh, group that disagree with one another but that's okay so the elementary particles move in such a way that they create a wave how about that they have no electrical charge it's stable uh, they carry energy and momentum which are dependent on the frequency so it's uniform frequency is what they're saying and um, so they travel at the speed of light in an empty space unless you fill it with water or something not only is light made up of photons but electromagnetic energy this is where it gets a little weird and so photons are made up of, of waves 
so the waves and particles so Einstein was saying no no no, no don't don't go over the particle stuff it's a waveform theory states that light behaves like a wave and a particle is called a wave particle if you can't figure it out call it a wave particle and it's not a wave it's not a particle it's something and something in between but that's okay all I care about is that there's a frequency and that's what we're going to talk about so the light photons come in and a beam of light can eject electrons from a metal in other words the frequency of, of that light somewhere in there was enough to excite uh, the electrons from a particular metal and they ejected and so he knows that hmm that somehow it's ejecting those and it, it could be because of resonance it could be all sorts of things that he didn't really know but with all the ranges of energy that's in sunlight obviously one of them is going to affect the uh, the um, ion or the uh, atom that's in this uh, material the sodium and so it ejected it so a range of energy that humans can see this of course always comes down to what we can see of course in the wavelengths of light and uh, I've already talked about pigments and the like but there are certain materials light absorbing pigments like chlorophyll A and B that when exposed to certain frequencies of light they resonate so around 420 or so chlorophyll A starts to resonate in other words starts to shake violently and also somewhere out at around 700 uh, well it's actually 680 I think it is and then you see carotenoids and they resonate at slightly different uh, frequencies and chlorophyll B, uh, B uh, resonates at a different uh, so they all have the pigments have a certain characteristic of resonating uh, at whatever uh, frequencies that uh, basically uh, floated spoke you know it's a, there's a frequency that's unique that causes it to resonate and when it does it shakes and I'll show that again but in chlorophyll what it does is it becomes sort of like an antenna and out of all the different frequencies if it picks up one that makes it resonate it starts to resonate and when it does it's in close proximity uh, as the photon comes in and it, it starts to be uh, the sort of the driving force uh, sort of like hitting the uh, first resonator and then that resonance is repeated over and over if you notice the only middle one is vibrating uh, this tuning fork here so when this is hit sort of like when you hit that uh, initial chlorophyll or that uh, antenna you hit it it rings the bell and it starts to resonate with whatever uh, you know it will find what it will resonate with because it would be unique so this tuning fork doesn't have the same characteristics and it doesn't resonate but this one does so we found just through just the natural forces there's one that seems to resonate with that frequency and it's usually the same kind of density and everything as this one and then the last one isn't affected so the resonance is very unique for a particular um, substance or material so everything we we have a resonant frequency uh, it's pretty low it's like 13 hertz or something like that I forget so here's here's glass if you were to blast it with a particular frequency and it's it, it hits somewhere around 550 or whatever it was for glass the glass starts to vibrate so violently it breaks and that is the response of frequency and I learned that when I was working in a gas station once when I was about 15 and I was doing brake work which requires spinning a metal thing and smoothing off the brake shoes on or the brake metal surface on the inside well I forgot to put the sound dampening rubber thing on it and I was in a hurry or whatever and I uh, was starting to smooth it and it made this squeal really loud squealing noise of course I didn't hear it that way when I usually put the damper on it but I didn't well what happened was the frequencies that were generated were just right of course and it broke the majority of the bay windows in the garage and 
So that was a pretty uh, wimpy week for as far as pay was concerned because I had to pay for all the glass that got broken because of my uh, uh, inability to remember to put a rubber um, strap around the, the brake drum I was uh, turning. So anyhow, resonance, it will match the frequency and it will start to vibrate violently. And so photosynthesis is the same, but there is a characteristic that we see and you see it all the time, but you're not really aware of what's going on. So when you look at leaves and you see the certain colors, uh, there's certain pigments in the, the leaf that's reflecting the light because it's not absorbing it. If it doesn't absorb it, it reflects it. So it's filtering out that particular frequency of light. And we see that reflected light as colors. Oh, that's green or that's red or that's orange. You notice in fall, like right now, fall, you start to see different colors and the leaves are no longer green. You start to see yellow. And that's the result of secondary pigments. The first primary, the chlorophyll, is not made anymore. So the leaves now start to change a little bit and we start to see different colors. And you can see that being reflected here with the amount of so more carotenoids are actually forming here in this particular color. So this reflected light off here is not going into the leaf, it's reflected and you're seeing it as color in green. And this one, um, as different pigments become more predominant and chlorophyll is no longer there to reflect the light, we see different colors being reflected. And that's, that's the differences in, in the fall colors, but now you see what's going on. And of course, photosynthesis, through the process of abscission, if you know what that means, it means that the leaf is basically cut off from the plant and that, that leaf's going to fall down. Of course, we know that happens in fall. So it's not really photosynthesizing anymore and it's starting to lose the functionality of the uh, pigments. But, so the light comes in. The important part of all that blab, okay, that I was talking about, is that you're getting a filtering effect some of that green is being reflected and it's not allowed into the chamber, this chloroplast chamber. So in addition for containment, it also is filtering color, various frequencies of light that comes in. So of all the frequencies that come in to uh, that leaf, if you notice, there's some regions that are devoid of color, uh, black. And so some of the other colors now become more pure as a result. You think about that. If we're taking out some, we're filtering out some of the light, then that allows some of the other frequencies to sort of be, to stand out and become more pure. That's key in, in uh, photosynthesis because we need that good, clean frequency. Unlike that uh, lady, it was in Harry Potter that couldn't break the glass because her voice wasn't perfect. She couldn't generate the 550 hertz or whatever it was that she needed. Um, so the sunlight filters out, or the plant filters out the sunlight that uh, of frequencies that actually aren't not useful in its purpose. So when we do that, uh, we get the purified. So a very simple uh, experiment, if, if you have a dog whistle, you can whistle and, and blow it and you'll hear, uh, no you won't, you won't hear it unless you're a dog, and a dog will hear it because their frequencies and some of the things, that the hairs in their ears can uh, wiggle and respond to that vibration and resonate with that and fire neurons. We don't have anything that resonates with that sound, so we don't hear it. It's the same with light. Uh, our eyes, of course, resonate uh, within the pigments within the eye. And when we have those pigments, in, we have rods and cones. Now, rods are for uh, brightness uh, or dimness, however you want to look at it, brightness of light. The cones are uh, related to color. And you can notice it's the primary colors, red, green, and blue. And if it resonates with a red and a little resonates with the green and you get a mixture of the two, then that's where you get the, the other colors generated. And so your brain gets information from a mixture of these. And isn't it amazing that various regions um, along the, the retina that uh, that image is there and it picks up which part of that has the red or green or blue or a mixture of those and those sorts of things. 
uh, brain is amazing sorting all of that information out. In fact, so much information is traveling yeah, through the optic nerve, it uh, doesn't even worry about. Uh, normally, most of our nerves have a sort of a covering over it. These are just raw nerves. They come fire right through the brain and delivers this information as fast as possible. That's why our eyes are embedded so close to within the brain that uh, the transmission is really quick and we need that because things change quickly and that sort of thing and so we get all that information but really what's happening is resonance of that light starts to shake these uh, pigments and when they do they fire neurons and then fires up uh, to the nerve fibers into the brain so if this starts shaking the nerves pick it up that's all it is and yeah, pretty straightforward so photosynthesis is powered by light energy, a type of kinetic. Photons hit chlorophyll and other light. So when it hits the chlorophyll, it goes bing. And then that tuning fork starts to vibrate at that particular tune, just perfect, and resonates that throughout. And that is what's cracking the water throughout the system. In other words, the water starts to vibrate precisely at the correct resonant frequency. And the hydrogens fall off and the oxygens fall off as they vibrate so so we get the oxygen molecules and hydrogen and that's really what we're doing is cracking uh, water and then we use that uh, to make the energy and I'm going to show you how we do that it's amazing so we shake things so rapidly uh, with the frequency that uh, we move to the electron to the next energy state and of course the water molecule just can't hang together. It, it just it starts to fall apart, which is the purpose. But the sunlight had to be filtered coming in and generate just the right frequency in order for that to go to the next energy state. And off we go. So here's the antennas for the, the pigments. And I, I brought in the magnesium sort of centered uh, chemical drawings for chlorophyll A. And uh, this is an it it has a certain resonance purified if we had all the green that came in through the leaf without having that pigment blocking or reflecting that color green uh, it wouldn't work it just wouldn't resonate there's too much that would muffle the frequency it has to be that pure just like that like that scene in Harry Potter where she's trying to break that glass with her voice and she can't she has to hit it against the wall uh, that would happen because the chlorophyll wouldn't be a true uh, pure signal so uh, with filtering because the, the uh, pigments in the leaf it filters that green so the chlorophyll resonates just at the right frequency and off to the ra races we go ping and the chlorophyll pings and then all water that's in the system that's prepared now to be cracked and and uh, we get the hydrogens uh, away from it uh, to, uh, to do what we need and that's what we in fact are doing and so um, the energy that we're uh, required to get to the next energy state and that's what we try to do so the electrons uh, the pigments excited a higher energy state when the electrons return to a uh, resting unexcited state the process the energy is released and some is transferred so when this occurs it's sort of like that old game you probably have never played it but of course I'm as old as a fossil and a hot potato and you throw this uh, whatever it was and it's real hot so you pass it to the next and the idea is every time everyone touches it eventually it starts to cool down and it gets uh, uh, so anyhow uh, that's sort of how the plant uh, handles these highly agitated uh, electrons that are flying all over the place because we're cracking water so the photon comes in we get the higher energy state electron jumps excited state after it's being absorbed and it's it's just popping all over the place and this is what they talk about when you um, are exposed to radicals and, and oxygen is a radical by the way and we have systems in our body that can handle it it can damage tissue if we allow it to sit around but it's moving and we can deal with it but uh, the plant has to do the same thing. So there's a series of systems, uh, plant chemicals, that handle being able to, to, to uh, 
quench, uh, 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 quench the the uh, electron energy that's in there so the plant doesn't get destroyed or catch fire or blow up or whatever. Um, so passing electrons from molecule to molecule is the way energy moves through cells. It's trying to slowly bring it down and into a form that it can use. And uh, that's what plants do. And meanwhile, it's extracting the hydrogen that's been cracked from the water to use for its purposes. So um, again, just as a summary, when chlorophyll gets hit by the photon, ping, it hits that uh, tuning fork. So now it broadcasts just the right frequency throughout. And only things that resonate with that pure signal, which happens to be water, we crack the water in making uh, the hydrogen. Okay. So here's uh, the two reactions if you look at it from the generalized boring version of what I'm trying to sell you today uh, the photoreaction the sunlight and water the photosystems packed we got to have water and crack it so now you know why we water plants is it's not just for vascular turgid uh, keep the plant stiff no it's there that's its energy source it gets its energy one way from the water and then the sun has to hit the water with a frequency is just right to crack the water and then we get the energy and that's why I think you're going to look at the plant a totally different way from now on is that the water is the energy so we're fueling this the plant with the water and the sun is cracking the water to get the energy that we need now the other part the synthesis is where we build sugar it's in gray so we're not worried about it right now and this is at night and uh, all the employees have to wear Calvin Klein clothes, uh, but I'll get into that later. Don't worry about it right now. So photosynthesis uh, is really uh, once you ping the uh, chlorophyll, uh, then you follow the electrons from there. And what we're doing is generating as much hydrogen as possible to charge across a membrane. So if you look uh, in this uh, chart here with the light energy we're forming hydrogens and hydrogens are used to spin the ATP synthases and I'll get into that right now but just know that the higher concentration of hydrogen inside this area in the chloroplast versus outside so there's a huge battery effect you notice where the ATP synthase is sort of monitored in, uh, in the membrane across the membrane that's a battery and so when the hydrogen zips through, it gives that momentary attraction to that positive, it spins as a result. And when it spins, it makes uh, uh, from ADP and inorganic phosphate ATP. Isn't that amazing? So it's cracked, cracking the water, it builds up in hydrogen. And that hydrogen spins through to go out because it's a battery effect. It's exactly what batteries do. It flows electrons or uh, energy particles. In this case, it's hydrogen. And that's that momentary positive charge is what it attracts to spin. And uh, I've already shown that in previous um, pieces of work that uh, spins the uh, ATP synthase and that makes the ATP. Um, it is quite amazing that it does this. So sunlight drives uh, the processes and in the process of handling the electrons because of all that high energy that's going on uh, not only when we crack the water and we get the high energy we have more energy created because of all the electrons are being flowed all over the place because we just shook this molecule all the pieces and when we did we start to get all sorts of changes as a result of having all of this high energy and it drives subsequent other reactions that help produce you notice it's going from NADP don't worry about the name but what's different it's got a hydrogen associated with it and hydrogens are the the key piece to drive uh, the battery effect across the membrane so the more hydrogens that we can make and the electron transport chain is the biggest winner by the way talk about that but it's it's all driven from the initial event of water but we get the hydrogens extracted and it's the hydrogens that uh, spin the ATP synthase so that equation right there 
that you're always taught about C6, you know, 6 CO2, 6 waters, going to 6 C, uh, 6, uh, C6, H12O6 plus 6O2 is the output of glucose and oxygen. This doesn't say much. This tells a story up here at the top. And we're cracking water because uh, of resonant frequencies and shakes the water so violently. We literally shake off the hydrogens when we use that to charge the battery across the membrane to form the ATP synthase to spin. Now, how is that? You like that? So, the water splitting photosystem does exactly that. The sun reacts, the chlorophyll molecule ping, you get the perfect frequency and then that's resonating throughout the cell and when it does uh, the water's being shaken uh, quite violently and then uh, the oxygen's released and the hydrogens uh, start to contribute to charging the battery and the electrons oddly enough that are high energy that are, can damage and oxidize the membrane um, are actually used as they're being uh, passed along with that hot potato I was mentioning before to the electron transport chain and and the biggest factor of that is it creates hydrogen and that charges the battery so the energy charging or capturing process is passing the hot potato and going through uh, sort of the um, the centers that all resonate that sort of thing and things are resonating and water is cracking and then uh, we transfer electrons that are falling apart. Once we start cracking the water, boy, we get all this high energy just going all over the place. Now, normally it can damage the the, uh, the plant, but because of these specialized little proteins that are hanging around, uh, it uh, brings it down to a point where uh, it uh, it makes it so that it doesn't damage the plant, which is really important. So the uh, chemical solar cells, the plant pigments can only absorb specific wavelengths of energy because it blocks it. We see the leaf as green because it's reflecting things that it doesn't want. And green contains all sorts of other colors and it, what it's doing is trying to purify the wavelengths that are coming into the plant. And uh, we get that. And we know that some of those plant pigments like chlorophyll, because of ping, we ping it and it gives you that perfect resonant frequency uh, because of that. It's sort of like an antenna. And when it resonates, it causes all sorts of um, sort of a transfers of, of the energy, but the ultimate is it's cracking water. And to the point, once we summarize it here, we get the light coming in, we, we have um, the light cracking the water, and we see the hydrogen coming across. And then the electrons, as a result of this smashing, it's sort of like a linear accelerator, the, the hydrogen and all that's breaking. The electrons are fly, flying out. Uh, we have a way of passing that hot potato such that we get more hydrogens out of it. We, we squeeze every bit of energy out of that and to the point where we can even save some of it with these other chemicals like NAD and charge it with NADPH um, through these. But it's the electrons that we're trying to uh, squelch so they don't hurt the plant and we pass it through a series of proteins that eventually handle that electron um, energy to, uh, to, to squelch it so it's uh, not damaging. But the net result is we have this huge buildup of hydrogen on one side of the membrane versus the other. And that allows the hydrogen to go from an area of higher concentration. You see how we build on everything? An uh, area of higher concentration to a lower concentration through a membrane. And it gives it that momentary positive charge. This starts to be attracted to it and starts spinning. And when it starts spinning, then the subunits handle the ADP and inorganic phosphate to come in close proximity to make ATP and that's it. It does that sustainably because it's a rotational type of effect. And so it just sits there and just turns them out one right after another. And uh, it's, it's a really very clever system. So the big win of course is you start the reactions and you're pinging the system and you're constantly cracking the water and you're generating all this high energy electrons that have to be squelched and it's handled by a series of proteins 
and we get this big wind through the electron transport chain that all it does is it just moves all the hydrogens uh, through the various system to, uh, of cracked water that uh, we, we get the hydrogens in there to charge the battery to get the ATP synthase ultimately to make that right there and lots of it. We need lots of it. Uh, we're, we're pretty high maintenance. We have to have a lot of energy. So what the battery effect is, is there's a higher concentration. This is the positive and this is the low concentration and comparatively it's the negative, right? This is the positive side, this is the negative, so you have that positive negative. Um, that's a, that's a uh, battery effect across the membrane. And as a result now, the hydrogens will move from an area higher concentration to a lower uh, to spin um, ATP. That arrow is going the wrong way, I just noticed that. Uh, we're going from higher concentration to lower, so that arrow needs to be going the other way. Um, whoops. <laughs> um, so anyhow, it's amazing I only find these things out when I actually present these. But anyhow, so here's sort of a picture to summarize with. We have the water cracking event and we have electrons that are passed off as a result of just exploding these water. Now these waters are being shaken so violently that uh, all sorts of electrical effects are happening and electrons are flying. So we have a series of proteins that can handle that high energy and in the process of doing that uh, can make more hydrogens that, uh, re that contribute to the battery charging and then ATP synthase which makes the ATP. That's it. That is photosynthesis and uh, however you want to look at it uh, the idea is that you're generating huge amount of electron uh, by uh, uh, shaking water so violently that we get the hydrogens charging one side of the membrane versus the other creating the ba battery effect that spins ATP synthase and all of this occurs in the membranes of the thylakoid and so we have the battery highest concentration inside the thylakoid less outside so the hydrogens are constantly going out spinning those and then this is uh, spitting ATP into the uh, a stroma, the liquid around the thylakoid, getting ready for the night crew to come in and uh, incorporate that chemical energy into cookies or sugar. So the uh, uh, the effects are really quite easy to follow. So uh, we're getting the summary again. This is uh, really just for your um, review, but the water splitting, the electrons transport. So we have the electrons going in there. Uh, we're cleaning out, but we're squelching as much of that high energy so we don't damage the plant. And we have other types of chemicals that can grab more of the hydrogens. But at the end of the day, uh, we're charging uh, the battery so we can make ATP. And for that amazing ATP synthase, uh, the spin. So that momentary charge comes in, causes the protein to be attracted to the negative part uh, of a stator which is here and it's attracted to that so it starts to spin and it goes around and then finally the hydrogen is released and in the process causes the two subunits here to take uh, ADP and inorganic phosphate put it in such close proximity to make ATP without hardly any energy uh, being um, used and you can see the uh, um, motion graphic down here if you want uh, as review I've already shown you that so the idea at the end of the day for photosynthesis is making the ATP molecule which is the chemical bond energy associated in that third phosphate group that we need uh, to drive and do work um, no matter it's enzymes or whatever we we got to do NADPH uh, we, we mentioned in there is the second product but all this is doing and I gave you the chemical structure I'm not going to have you know that but the idea it's just generating enough for uh, the pickup so efficient just even any scraps left over that can generate hydrogen we can use that to charge the battery so that process if you've ever heard the, the redox or the reduction oxidation and um, a discussion before it's really if you look at the differences that we reducing the number of available uh, 
uh, hydrogens uh, being filled here because when we reduce it uh, you notice it's not double bonding there's three over on this molecule there's only two over here so the um, uh, the octet rule is actually being filled instead of just uh, putting in a cyclic uh, it's actually filling it with the hydrogen so we're reducing seats that's how I remember it so you add the hydrogen to reduce the number of seats uh, where you oxidize which is where it can cause damage because these are more unstable than these because it's it's uh, passing around trying to convince everything in here is cool everybody's got their octet rule followed or filled but uh, you know, don't check it but just I'll just believe me we're doing that so it's is rapidly sharing those sorts of things so it's this is more unstable than this side so when you oxidate something you're taking away uh, the hydrogen or the seats and you're emptying the seats and it makes it just a tad more unstable so anyhow when you reduce it and make the hydrogen here that's what we use uh, to charge the battery even more so I just thought I'd go over that a little bit so there's uh, two parts of photosynthesis we've been spending time on the photo part and uh, which light energy is transformed into chemical bond energy while splitting water molecules and producing oxygen the energy of sunlight is first captured purified and then the chlorophyll thing generates that perfect um, uh, uh, frequency that uh, now causes water to get cracked and off it goes and then the rest of it is to just really to charge a battery with hydrogen across the membrane so ATP synthase can spin and wow we did a lot that part two was a bear but uh, there's some really cool parts to I'm going to talk about next in part three and uh, I'll be going over that but I hope you uh, will truly look at a leaf differently now that you've had this discussion and uh, I'll see you at part three